Welcome back to another episode of the Jaws Obsession, where we are here to share with you, prove to you, convince you, or remind you that Jaws is the greatest movie of all time. Welcome back to episode 39 of the Jaws Obsession. A big cause for celebration. I was not going to get to an episode this week because kind of tired. We've been, uh, I've been burning the candle at both ends here. Over the weekend, did a final sprint, took a day off from work, pushed out the last of the editing for the Book of Quint. So we do have what is now the second to last final version of the Book of Quint, all formatted. I have that in my very hands right here. If we can listen, that's the entire book right there. 436 pages. 137,936 words. We have a prologue, an epilogue, 54 chapters. The writing has been finished, and now the editing, the main part of the editing has been finished, of which, over the course of editing, 2,684 suggested editorial changes were made to the Book of Quint. Every sentence has been combed over, and what's interesting is that the process never stops. That was just on the computer. Now that I have a hard copy of the Book of Quint, I am going page by page and looking for anything that I may have missed because the computer hides errors. When you see the layout in broad daylight in your hands, things change sentences stand out that might not have looked that that are not correct that the sentence structure or something might not be correct that it looked maybe i was too tired or i missed it on the computer so there are there is a triple and a quadruple check going on with this book before it gets out to the backers of the indiegogo campaign this book will have been through the ringer so i am going page by page through the hard copy of the book of quinn of which even the prologue i just found 19 different editorial changes that need to be corrected and given some attention so that's just in the prologue there's 19 so i'm going chapter by chapter because everything looks different when you see it presented in front of your eyes on paper. We're still on the Peter Benchley timeline. We're still ready to get this book pumped out at the end of October. We have to be at the printer by uh, October 1st. It's a sprint to the finish here. I did not have time to prepare one of the uh, more uh, bigger episodes or a formal episode. I do have a lot of topics I want to get into on the Jaws Obsession, but right now it's the priority is getting the Book of Quint finished. So that's why today we will be tackling a State of the Union of Jaws. Jaws IMAX. Jaws was released in IMAX. We have some emails to get to, and in order to do that, I'm going to bring on my good friend and technical advisor to the Book of Quint, John Tedder, in order to get some information, because that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be just uh, talking about some JAWS information 
here for this uh, a lighter episode of the Jaws Obsession, episode 39. Thank you for returning and lending your time to jump into the Jaws Obsession and give us another listen. Thank you very much. We have some things to reveal and some stuff to go over. John, how are you doing today? Doing pretty good. It's been great. We've gotten a lot of good feedback on these uh, postcards here that are going around. I understand you got one from someone in England, reached out to you on Instagram. Yeah, um, his name's Alex Lavelle. He uh, tagged me in his Instagram story, and uh, he, he so far, he seems to be really enjoying the postcard. He's excited to see what else uh, there is to come. I just think that the, the postcard came out just the way we wanted it in that tourist shop way of expressing what Amity Island looks like, but we're not giving away the whole game. For the Book of Quint, you're going to have a more complete map with detailed locations with lighthouses, locations of uh, Jaws events. There's a 1974 map and a 1951 map. So I think the people that got these postcards, these were the backers for the Indiegogo campaign to the Book of Quint. They're going to see a more detailed map once they receive the book. David L. wrote in, he said, I love the postcard. It went right up on the fridge. I'm really enjoying the audiobook chapters. He's referencing episode 37. They were very well done. I'm surprised that Larry Vaughn showed up. Yeah, everybody's loving that little surprise at the end of uh, chapter 17, which is tease it up for the rest of the book after that first third. He says, I totally visual- visualized him in his anchor suit. I really enjoy the subtle music, sound effects, and distinct voices of the different for the different characters that were done for the audiobook. The editing is going well. And that's another thing, John. Maybe we can talk about I called you right away, 436 six pages long as it stands right now. It is a whopper. And what I did first, John, I called you up. I made sure that you got the files. You received the entire book. So that's our, if an asteroid falls on my head, this book's still coming out, right, John? Absolutely. This next two weeks is very critical. What are you working on on your end to bring all the files home for the Book of Quint over the next two weeks? Because we got to be off to the printer in October. What I'm specifically working on is just the very last minute details of the map itself and there's a more expanded map that shows you exactly where Amity is located in location to Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket, and then the Cape Cod mm-hmm. and Long Island. You know, you get to see where everything's at. There's a pullback because Montauk on the end of Long Island comes into play right. with the story. So there's different views of Amity from close up and then pull back because there's a lot that goes on in the waters around Amity to the south, to the west, to the east in the story of the Book of Quint. So we have to be able to reference all that. We're also throwing together an appendix where we're going to have different tools and equipment, as well as some nomenclature for the orca, right? Yes. John, while while we have you here, I did get an email, and maybe we can tackle this right now, because Jaws, inquiring Jaws fans want to know. Noel C. wrote in, greetings from Boston. I discovered the podcast a few weeks ago, and have thoroughly enjoyed every episode. As a lifelong Jaws fan, I really appreciate the amount of detail you go into and cannot wait to receive my copy of the Book of Quint. I'm writing in response to a comment that was made by Steven Spielberg during the Columbo episode, in which he states that after finding out about the orca being destroyed, that he was able to retrieve the twin screws from the boat. That would seem to be in stark contrast to John Tedder's assertion that the orca had a single four-cylinder Ford engine, necessitating only one propeller. I'm also following John's work on Orca Rebuild. Uh, over at orcarebuild.com and youtube.com slash orcarebuild. And to be honest, would tend to side with anything that John says, given his meticulous attention to detail with the project. Was Spielberg mistaken? It seems like an odd detail to be mistaken about, though maybe someone gave him a random set of shafts and propellers to calm him down and after and figured he wouldn't know the difference. What do you think? Noel C. from Boston. You know, before John, before we get to your answer, let's just play that clip right now that he's talking about. Here's Spielberg talking about the two propellers that he has. And it kind of freed me when they broke the boat into many pieces. But I did recover both twin screws. I got the propeller blades back, and I got the, uh, I got the pilot wheel. Well, let's get this answer right out of the way. This was a discussion you and I had re- very early on back in December regarding uh, the portrayal of the orca in the Book of Quint. So how many propellers did the orca have? She only had one screw on her. She only had one, and that there's evidence of that of her out of the water. Right, right. There was only one. We have pictures of the orca being refurbished. Yeah, she was being overhauled and being transported to the Long Beach Marina. Yes, and if we go to the show notes, Telegram 
channel at Jaws OB. I'm going to have show notes over there. We went over this in detail for episode 19. If everybody wants to learn about the orca and what happened after the filming of Jaws, episode 19 is the episode where we tackled this, and John had a lot of details there. But I'm going to take some of those pictures and put them back on for this, the show notes for this episode to show that there's only one propeller underneath. There's only one propeller. So why would Spielberg say that he has two? Well, first, we got to look at a couple things. Number one, this is based off of, at the time, a, probably a 30, 35-year-old memory. And memory suck. They just do. I mean, the older you get as time goes by. Memory suck. I mean, I can't remember something from five years ago. On top of that, what during filming, the orca actually suffered damage to her screw when they put her hard over. And for people that don't know, putting a, a vessel hard over is when you turn the wheel to the most extreme point, point that it can go, turning the rudder so you can make a tight turn. Mm-hmm. They put her hard over, and the rudder swung into the screw as it was turning because the cable that was going to the rudder, it snapped. Well... It swung into the screw while it was turning and damaged the prop. So she had to be taken out of the water, and she had to have her screw repaired. Now, as far as I know, all they did was cut it off and then re-weld it, mm-hmm. which is, it is a fix, but you really need a new one. There's actually a picture of this, and Ryan, I'll send it to you. Oh, cool. There's actually a picture of this. Now, it looks like a black and white photo, right. but it's not. It was taken at night. And she had those real big giant quartz lights shining down on her. And as bright as they are from the distance it was taken at, she looks like she's white, but it's not. It's just the paint being reflected off of the light. And as bright as it is, it makes it look black and white. It's actually a really cool effect. That's fantastic. So that was the night they were repairing this damaged propeller for the Orca. Yes. And what I believe Spielberg is talking about that in one of the pictures of when... Alan and Jerry, the owners of the orca after filming, right? the orca sat out of the water for months, and they bought her. And there were some repairs they had to do. And in one of the pictures where they're repairing her on the set for the Gilligan's Island set, so I believe that they probably kept that screw just in case you needed another one. Okay, so what we're looking at here is there was a lot of spare parts and stuff that might have been in the Orca when Universal acquired it, reacquired it back. There was a possible new propeller on the Orca, but the old one that was damaged or repaired was also maybe stowed down below, correct? Yes. So when the guys, when everyone, when they destroyed the Orca and threw it into the dumpster and then Spielberg flipped out, that, 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 remember, everybody go back and listen to episode 19 if you want to know the full story. But so Spielberg has a, uh, he, he kind of has some words with the guy on the phone. So they go back to salvage whatever they can to make Mr. Spielberg happy and they find two propellers. So they give it to Steven. And that's when in, uh, in the interview, he says, I have two propellers. What Noel picked up on is, was he mistaken? It's possible that he, hit, he I don't think he's mistaken that he has two propellers, but the Orca was a single propeller vessel. Correct. Yes. And and that actually, that propulsion system, everything plays into the Book of Quint. It's a very intricate part to part three of the Book of Quint. So we all have to really know what the dynamics of the Orca were the uh, from the propulsion system and everything. You know, there's a temptation at this point to sit there and and relax. I haven't been on Mm. vacation in two years. Uh, (laughs) I, I really miss going to the beach. I would really love to go swimming, but What's in this took 27 months, uh, 11 months of writing. And, uh, John, you've been my the technical advisor on the book since December of last year. So, you know, we're, we're, we're approaching 10 months of working on this book almost every pretty much every week, almost daily. So, there's a temptation at this point to kind of rest back and sit there and go, okay, the story's out. But that's the, that's the hard part is, is sitting there and just keep the, uh, the foot down, pedal to the metal, keep the momentum going forward. And that's what we're doing. So this next two weeks is crucial. We're going to hammer out these, uh, these maps. We're going to hammer out the appendix and uh, the formatting that has to take place. And then it's off to the printer. Yeah, so thanks, Noel, for writing. So uh, yeah, Kevin, uh, Kevin A. wrote in from New Jersey. Hi, Ryan. I went to see Jaws last night in IMAX for the first time with my wife and friend. There were so many diehard fans at the theater. Many, like myself, had Jaws shirts on. Uh, it was awesome, and I was really impressed with the great surround sound in the theater. 
making the movie come to life, especially at the end of the movie, Fighting Bruce on the Orca. When I came home, I immediately listened to the new podcast, uh, taking in the audio version of the two chapters. I came away with a better understanding of Quint's arm injury that you analyzed in episode 18. Also, how revered Quint was in the Navy with his survivor status from being on the USS Indianapolis. I think that's great that Kevin picked that up that the because that that is that there is that is from real research that the survivors of the USS Indianapolis after the tragedy they were given a wide berth in a way all of them processed out of the military after that but in those days we had i read letters on one of the episodes where one guy was kind of let he rode his motorcycle home to visit his family many times without permission and it was kind of looked the other way. You could tell that the Navy brass was looking the other way for these uh, survivors. And that's kind of, that is the basis of how I approached how would the Navy have handled Quint, who decided to stay in after after the USS Indianapolis. Thanks for your devotion to the Outstanding Podcast, completion of the Book of Quint. Keep up the upstanding outstanding work with this. All the true Jaws fans appreciate you, brother. Thank you. Uh, that warm regards and God bless Kevin A. from New Jersey. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for writing in. John, this this leads us to what I wanted to talk about here. And I'm going to have these articles that we're going to be referencing here in the show notes. So over at Fangoria Magazine, there was an article um, from September 7th, only a few about mm-hmm. last week. Uh, Jaws re-enters the top 10 at the box office thanks to the 3D re-release. Nearly 50 years after its original release, Steven Spielberg's Jaws has become a hit yet again on the big screen. Lack of strong competition for the Labor Day weekend, Jaws hauled in $3 million in ticket sales on National Cinema Day this past Saturday. The enduring nature of Spielberg's work resulted in Jaws earning $3.3 million over the weekend counting the Monday holiday. The figure was good enough to land the number eight spot on the charts for the holiday weekend. It still has an endearing quality to our society, uh, just to the world, right, John? It does, and it, it also shows that the shark is still working. I mean, is it is it really surprising that Jaws was in the top 10? It's a summer movie. It's at the end of summer. I think it's interesting that Universal is still able to ride the wake of Jaws 50 years later. And we've talked about this, John, you, John, you and I, we've had a lot of conversations back and forth regarding the Universal's treatment of the franchise. So mm-hmm. this is going to lead to the next article. What I wanted the viewers to know is that right now, Jaws is, uh, it's, it's, a hot, it's still a hot commodity. And it was proven by this re-release that went on. And now comes the interesting point. Now comes the interesting point where... I'll ask everybody out at the Jaws Obsession and all the listeners out there is how do you feel Universal should handle Jaws going forward? We do know that the 50th anniversary is coming up in 2025. So, John, was this a feeler? Was this a a, a trial run? Was this a trial balloon that they floated into the air to see if Jaws is still viable? I think it possibly is because I don't remember the exact year it might have been 2011 or 2012 but they decided to re-release jurassic park into the imax in standard imax form and also in 3d mm-hmm. and then a roughly a year later steven spielberg announced that i believe it was comic con that they were working on jurassic park 4 which would become jurassic world so it's possible right i mean that's what i think it is Right. And that so now we have to look at what is the mentality over at Universal and how are they going to handle Jaws going forward? And it seems to me that there's a lot of pessimistic people when when it comes to Jaws, even though they're Jaws fans, they think that it's impossible to do anything more with the franchise. And I wanted to reference there's an article written here by William Jones, and it was published only a few days ago on CBR.com. We're going to reference these articles over at the show notes at our Telegram channel. So if you follow the link below in this broadcast, you'll, you can just click on over there and read this article for yourself. But the article is titled, Why Universal Hasn't Rebooted Jaws. In a world where everything gets rebooted, Spielberg's Jaws has been miraculously spared such treatment. But why exactly hasn't Universal rebooted it? Uh, Mr. Jones writes, it's a bit baffling that the Jaws franchise has been allowed to remain dormant for so long. While there were a string of sequels in the decade following Jaws, Jaws' release, 
It's now been over 30 years since the last Jaws film was released. In our current pop cultural landscape, in which anything and everything, with even the vaguest hint of SEO-approved IP franchising potential, is regurgitated without a second thought, how has Jaws managed to escape the fate and not been rebooted by Universal Studios? He says a huge con- contributing factor is the... Uh, to this phenomenon is the fact that the Jaws sequels themselves. Devoid entirely of Spielberg's involvement, the Jaws sequels were a definitive case of diminishing returns, both financially and in terms of the sheer quality of the films. Jaws 2, released in 78, was decried as lesser than the original upon release, but still largely performed well at the box office, receiving uh, middling reviews. Jaws 3D, released in 1983, made less than half the box office intake of the previous film and was roundly, roundly dismissed as gimmicky, schlock, by critics and audiences alike. And finally, Jaws the Revenge, released in 87, made even less at the box office, and it is notoriously so awful that even Michael Caine, an actor in the film, refuses to watch it. Over over 12 years, he, he's continuing to write, over, over just 12 years, Jaws has gone from monolithic force in pop culture to the butt of a bad joke. While sequels like Jaws 2 are largely harmless, predictable, and lesser iterations of what came before, Jaws 3D and Jaws Revenge were so bad that they actively chipped into the legacy of Jaws itself in the public eye. This means that following 1987, Universal reluctantly rele- realized that in order to revitalize Jaws' iconic legacy, it needs to give the sequels a rest. So I'm going to stop right there. We kind of agree with that, right, John? He's kind of hits the nail on the head right there, doesn't he? Yeah, he did more than hit it on the head. It's a very good summation of where we are with Jaws. I mean, we're, we're now in 2000, at the end of 2022. We have the 50th anniversary coming up in 2025. Okay, so what he talks about now is where I kind of where he kind of splits off on this tangent. What what he writes now is while this meant audiences were no longer inundated with steady steadily worsening Jaws films, cinemas remained absolutely saturated with films from the subgenre that the Jaws pi- that Jaws pioneered, shark movies. From schlock classics like Joe Dante's uh, Piranha and uh, Killer Fish released in the immediately after in the immediate aftermath of Jaws in the 70s to more modern films like Deep Blue Sea, The Shallows, Meg, 47 Meters Down, etc. All of these films owe a tremendous debt to Spielberg's Jaws. But the sheer volume of these films has led to another fascinating conundrum for the Jaws franchise to ponder. What makes a Jaws film truly Jaws. So to have a shark in the film and take influence from the structure or Tony, the original Jaws is precisely what other franchises and filmmakers have been churning out for over three decades. So what remains to make a new Jaws special in 2022? Well, the go-to answer would be narrative connectivity. A gargantuan factor that contributed to Jaws' success was its unforgettable characters from Roy Scheider's Chief Brody to Richard Dreyfuss' Matt Hooper, So it makes sense to return to those wells, but remarkably, Jaws has already burned through the vast majority of potential characters a new film might look to explore. Uh, Jaws 2 already saw the return of Chief Brody. Jaws 3 centered on Brody's grown sons, Michael and Sean. Jaws Revenge focused on Brody's wife. This leaves precious little untrodden story for any potential new Jaws film to tell. Another key factor that would provide substantial obstacles is to a new Jaws film, is the fact that Jaws was so distinctly a cinematic miracle of its time. Spielberg film, Spielberg's film itself is absolutely timeless, but its endearing legacy was born as a direct result of the systems in place in 1975. He goes on to list some, some reasons why he believes that, that, that Jaws can't be replicated. And, if, and then he continues, if any recent film's release offers a look at what Universal would most certainly be hoping for with a new Jaws, it would be 2015's Jurassic World, itself a reboot of a beloved Spielberg classic after decades of declining sequels. In the end, there's a litany of factors contributing to the con- continued silence on Jaws. Bad sequels, middling profits, a lack of story left to tell, uncertain financial prospects, etc., But the biggest reason of all is pretty simple. Spielberg and company delivered an astonishing film with Jaws, and that is damn near impossible to replicate on pretty much every level. Any attempts to recapture that magic seem destined to fall short in one way or another. Wow. So that was author William Jones and his take on why the Jaws has never been rebooted and there will be no Jaws sequel. 
John, after hearing that article, what is missing to that equation? Let's just come out and say it. What's missing from that equation is is that Jaws, we've already always talked that Jaws is a, a, a human movie with a monster shark. It's not a sh- monster shark movie. That's what makes Jaws 1 special. And it sort of had elements of that in number two, which is why I think that number two was, it was adequate, but it still followed the monster shark invades island formula. What he doesn't talk about is a prequel. What are your thoughts of the article first, before we get into the prequel talk? What are your thoughts of that article? I think he hit the nail on the head and, you know, he didn't talk about a prequel, you know. Okay, this is what I don't like hearing. I I never like hearing the word reboot, okay? Mm -hmm. When it comes to Jaws... I don't want to hear reboots because we have an established universe that has yet to, the potential has yet to be tapped. Right. Okay. So Jurassic World was a reboot of a, of a franchise that was already tapped with many sequels. So they've already explored a lot of possibilities with the characters, correct? Mm -hmm. I guess that's my, I guess that's my concern here is everyone nowadays is reboot happy remake happy and reissue happy and we just saw jaws be reissued yet again but now we've they reissued it into imax and to the fans enjoyment of course seeing jaws on the big screen is great and i think jaws should be shown in screens permanently 24 7 for the rest of our tomorrows there should be a theater out there that you could go to watch jaws however rebooting the franchise is missing all the potential that we have that's in the movie jaws that we've spent 30 going on this is 39 episodes 21 hours of content on the jaws obsession exploring other information and other material that's in the movie jaws see that's the thing is i think universal might be short-sighted here in that they look at other franchises to see how they should react and we talked about being reactive and proactive Mm. right now universal is being very reactive they're seeing how meg 2 does They're seeing how Jurassic, you know, they're seeing, I mean, that's their franchise with Jurassic World, but they're seeing, they're reactive when it comes to Jaws. They're not proactive. They're not attacking the material. And, you know, and and this is a conversation you and I've had a lot, is Jaws is not the Meg. It's it's not the Meg 2. It's a human movie with a monster shark, like you said. You put it very well when you said it's a universe that's not been tapped into. There's a lot that they could have done with it. There's a lot that they can still do with it. And, you know, it's something that you and I also talked about that after Jaws 2, if they were to do another one, they should have got away from the Brody family and, yes. and did something else. And I brought up the fact that one of the, in my opinion, one of the better shark movies within the past probably 20 years is probably the 2016's The Shallows with uh, Blake Lively. Yeah, yeah. And that, if they were to do another Jaws movie, do something along that line. Yeah, we talked about that. That yeah, exactly. Because with the Halloween franchise, and many of mm-hmm. our, many of our listeners are probably familiar with Michael Myers' Halloween franchise, and we talked about John Carpenter, who was the director of Halloween. He really he did not like where number two went, and his he was a big fan of number three. Number three is a one off movie, completely devoid of Michael Myers, and what what we believe. What John and I were talking about is that Universal should have just followed that. It's a Jaws movie, but it's an, it's an alternate story. So there's alternate stories that involve sharks that can be under the Jaws label. And that's what uh, John Carpenter wanted. He wanted a movie. He wanted a franchise. He, he envisioned Halloween not following one guy in a mask, but Halloween being alternate stories, alternate movies that have to do with Halloween. So that was where the franchise was going. And they could have done this as after number two, they should have left, they should have left the Brody family and went off to do if they, let's say they did a Blake Lively uh, Shallows and called it Jaws 3. That would have been excellent, you know, and then then they would have started a new trend there. But Mm -hmm. as far as sequels go, uh, it's just, that's where, I think that's where we're at. It's that there's this, there's this temptation to do everything bigger and crazier than the last so if meg 2 comes out and they have this gigantic megalodon swallowing up uh, hordes of people then there's they would go well if if we're going to do a jaws sequel we have to have a bigger shark than meg or we have to have five big sharks it's whoa 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 let's this is the problem is that don't focus on the shark 
Jaws should not be focused on, it should be a human story with a shark in the background, which is what The Shallows was with Blake Lively, right? Right. That's what we're doing here is not only is the Book of Quint a prequel, but it uses the characters and stories of those characters at the forefront, and the sharks play a backdrop and tie it all together. And that's how Jaws was, is that really it was a human movie where we learned about all these characters interacting with each other with a shark as the backdrop tying it all together. And that follows the same formula that is Jaws. So that's why I respectfully disagree with this author of the CBR.com article in that that I think the magic of Jaws can be replicated if you follow the characters and you tie it together with sharks. What do you think about that? Absolutely. I do not disagree with that. You know, it there there's a formula for Jaws, but at the same time, there's also an unknown formula that they've not gotten into. Like we just said, there's there's potential, there's there's a whole universe that they've not done anything with. Right. Right. The possibilities are endless on great storylines that they could tell, but they've not done it. Right. And I think that's what the book of Quint could do is it would fire up the the creative juices, the creative energy surrounding Jaws in that you could actually lateral it out going forward, alternate stories dealing with sharks as the backdrop, mm-hmm. but have them human stories. So if you want to tell that story, then you have it with a shark as a backdrop and it actually makes for a compelling read or a compelling movie. What I think is that there is still magic there and if anyone listened, I think those la- the last four episodes of the Jaws Obsession have been uh, essential. Episodes 35, 36, 37, and 38. That right there, those four episodes show you that there is still a lot of material here to be explored by Steven Spielberg, by Richard Dreyfus. We're excited to present this book to the world and to actually make our case. Yes, the trial balloon, the trial balloon was floated by Universal. Jaws is still a very popular franchise. Now, let's take care of that. Let's not drop it on our foot like we did with Jaws the Revenge. I've been really busy here, so I wasn't able to put any uh, very complex show together. So maybe this would be sort of like a popular, like a state of the union of where Jaws is at with these two articles about Jaws being in the box office, uh, top eight at the box office, and then this article right here about, I urge everybody to go read it and read... There's no options. Uh, That's another thing, John, is that as Jaws fans, we kind of have been played, we've allowed ourselves to be played into this lampooning of Jaws ever since Jaws 2. There's no options. They're saying that even even this, this gentleman is a serious Jaws fan, and he's saying that, yeah, it's been played out. Everything's been done. Everything's been tried. The cast was burned through. They've made a a gazillion different shark movies that spun off of the Jaws lexicon. And no one is putting anything out there as being proactive. What are we going to do about it? Are we just going to sit here and wait for 2025 to roll around and then complain when they re-release Jaws with a digital shark transposed or when they make a Jaws 5 with some very... Uh, with a mishmash of concepts. So John actually brought something to my attention and I wanted to focus on that. John, jumping off of this idea of the lampooning of Jaws, how we as Jaws fans allowed that to happen, we actually have proof. You have proof right now in your hands. You have proof that the Universal Studios, Universal itself was lampooning Jaws in the 70s. They were not taking the franchise seriously. Even after what the, how magnificent Jaws was, it was not realized to its potential. What exactly was Jaws 3, People 0? Whew, buddy, that's a lot to unpack. <laughs> so I'm going to make a long story into a short story the best that I can. Okay. Okay, so the original idea for Jaws 3, People 0 was... It was a National Lampoon movie, so think Chevy Chase, you know, Christmas Vacation. And, yep. you know, A comedy, yeah, straight comedy. Yeah, yeah, and it was going to be acknowledgement in the film that the first two Jaws movies were just movies that were made, and they were trying to come up with an idea for a third movie. 
And while filming a third movie, a real shark was going to come along and start wrecking, wrecking havoc and eating people. It turns into a musical. It gets it gets schlocky. It gets very yeah. it gets very slapsticky. And so this was an actual screenplay called Jaws Three People Zero. What? Uh, how did you find this rare screenplay of a movie that never came about? So this movie never got made. They got right to the almost to production. Correct. Yeah, it almost did get to production, but it got shut down. Okay, thank goodness it got shut down because I'll take the the Jaws 3D is a masterpiece compared to what this would have been. You have an actual screenplay that was was this optioned by Universal? Uh, it had to have been so, right. So yeah, and it's got production notes written by somebody all throughout it on the tops of the pages, on the sides of the pages, at the bottom. Right, it has things marked out, things highlighted, corrections made. So th- somebody had this of importance and was going through it making changes. Now it says first draft, June 15th, 1979 original story by Maddie Simmons written by John Hughes and Todd Carroll. Now what's interesting about that is, is John Hughes, right? John Hughes wrote the breakfast club, Francis Bueller's day off uncle buck. And you know, very many more 16 candles, a lot more movies, so yeah. which are very Ferris good. Bueller's. Yeah, absolutely. Big, big eighties screenwriter, director, John Hughes. Every, we all know John Hughes. So he wrote this, he mm-hmm. had a hand in writing this screenplay. Right. This would have been, it's a first draft. So there would have only been probably a handful of these to go out to producers and, you know, right. film executives. So yeah, to collectors, that's pretty rare, right? That to collectors, that's a rare screenplay you have there. Right. Back in the day, people were really looking for the script because there was a poster that someone had got a hold of and it come out and it said Jaws Three People Zero. It's actually a really interesting poster. What's interesting on the side of this, it's written in Sharpie in a red sharpie. It says Jaws Three People Zero, but at the head of that there is a zero on the side of that. So I'm thinking that this is since this says zero, maybe this was the first one that was given out and then another one says one, two, three and however many ah, there are. This is old school. That's like it's actually typed, right? It's a we're going to... Yeah, it's actually typed. I, there were some big names that were supposed to actually be in this. Okay. Some of the names in here mentioned was Robert Redford, Al Pacino, Christopher Reeve, Jill Kleber, George Burns, Jack Nicholson, Roy Scheider, Richard Dreyfuss, and Murray Hamilton were also supposed to reprise roles in this because they were written very specific lines in here for each and every one of them to say. They were going to be playing themselves. Yes, they'd be playing themselves as actors. Yep. And Steven Spielberg was going to be lampooned in the very beginning of it, saying he, he's only referred to as the director. Right. So but they, right. He is, it, it's very obvious. Spielberg and he's missing an arm and a leg because the sharks took him and all this. And so know, he refuses to do Jaws three. And, and see, uh, yeah. So this was about they were they were searching for they 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 came up with this comedy routine. They were going to make Jaws three people zero was going to be the third movie. Uh, as history goes, I do believe they got almost to production and then they finally pulled the plug and they went with a traditional Jaws 3 production, like monster shark attacks, SeaWorld type movie. For the audience, we're going to have scans of some of these pages of this screenplay to show you that we're not making this up. This is actual real, this is a real screenplay that John has. Are you going to put anything up on your uh, Instagram or anything? Yeah, I actually already have some stuff up there. Okay. And so if you go to Instagram, it's orca underscore rebuild. And I post directly through Instagram to Facebook, so it saves me some trouble. Okay, Kinda so lazy, I know. Well, no, no, that's fine. No, we've got to be efficient with our time. We always have to be efficient. <laughs> you have a big project going on to rebuild the orca, so but the, yeah, uh, orca underscore rebuild at Instagram is where you're going to be able to see all this stuff. But John, what again is the date on that screenplay? June fifteenth of nineteen seventy nine. So we had. Jaws 2 came out in in the summer of 1978. Mm -hmm. So we're talking one year later after that, they have already optioned the idea. There has already been a finished, uh, there was a story, then there was a screenplay written for a lampooning of the Jaws franchise in 1979 that was that's only five, four years after jaws premiered at the box office right let's put ourselves everybody in the jaws obsession put yourselves back into 1979 how does this now affect 
the tone of the Jaws franchise from 1979 going forward, when you have material, when you have material like this that was being bandied about Universal? I'll say this first, you know, and I've told you this, you know, I have a soft place for Jaws 3 because that is a movie that I saw with my mother. And my mother is the whole reason that I love Jaws in the first place. And so, mom, if you're listening, I love you. You know, when you start to do gimmicks with a film franchise, and I don't think there's an any better example than the, quote, what they're called the the scary movies, where they, I believe the first one, they uh, lampooned Scream, yep. and then it just went from there. From there, yeah. I think going. they did one of, I believe they did one of War of the Worlds, too. Yeah, and romantic comedies. There's no better, yeah. yeah, and, you know, there's no better example than that, but what Jaws 3 People Zero would have done was further solidify, and it still does further solidify, the fact that they even contemplated it. And it got to this level of an actual script and almost into production. Yeah. What it did was solidify the fact that they had run out of ideas and also that the material wasn't being taken seriously. Right. So off of that, they go, okay, we'll scrap that, but we're going to do, do Jaws 3D. And unfortunately, mm. what that does is that's a gimmick that you start writing around What images can we do 3D? Can we make the shark come through a glass window? Can we make someone spray something at the camera? And then you start writing the screenplay. So you're going from, you're writing around a gimmick, which is going to totally affect, absolutely affect the quality of that screenplay or the quality of the story. What we're trying to show here is that Universal ran out of ideas very early with the Jaws franchise. This screenplay is direct evidence of it. And afterwards, they were kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel, saying, well, how are we going to have the monster shark this time? Let's follow the Brody kids down to uh, Marine Land. What about Ellen Brody? How are we going to, maybe the shark can follow her. And what happened was, is that Jaws became a running joke. We saw many movies reference it, including Back to the Future 2, when Mm -hmm. it was, what was it, Jaws 25 or something? What was Back to the Future? There was like... There was some Jaws 19. Jaws 19, that's it. Where the big hologram shark comes down and tries to bite Marty and he says the shark still looks fake. So Universal mm. was even lampooning Jaws. Everyone out there listening to my voice, your favorite movie, in my opinion, and many opinion of others, the greatest movie of all time. We have an ongoing series here, a broadcast, proving that this is the greatest movie of all time because you can't do this with other movies. You can't go... Citizen Kane obsession. You can't take the Gone with the Wind obsession, even though those movies are rated higher by some of the critics and on the uh, America Film Institute top 100 movies of all time. The Jaws is the greatest movie of all time because we're just proving that by going by being able to talk about Jaws this much and this in depth as it's evolving, the movie evolves with how much you know about it. They were out of ideas and they were lampooning it for the since 1979, so 43 years and going. They're still sitting there going, how, you know, there's, they're still out of ideas. And that's where we ask everybody out there that loves Jaws to come together on this and just say, hey, there's more to the story to talk about. John and I talk about this a lot. We, I never, I never planned on doing this book or this, this broadcast. It just was something that had to be done. And there's been many times I've been sitting here These episodes take anywhere from 6 to 12 hours to put together. There's been many weeks where I've just sitting there going, what did I get myself into? And, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and same with you, John, with rebuilding the Orca. You're, you're, you are rebuilding the Orca. It's a wooden hull boat. It's unheard of. That's, there's ship rights and ship builders that would never take that project on. Correct. That. The, you're you're feeling the pressure down there too, and there's many times that you sit there and go, "What did I get myself into?" But that that means that our heart is invested in it, okay? Mm-hmm. Because we know that we want to do it justice. That you love the movie, you love the orca, and you're and, and right here, I'm tr- I love Jaws, and I would like to see it taken care of. The characters by Peter Benchley taken care of. Why lampoon? the work of Peter Benchley anymore. Let's all come together and let's show Universal exactly the potential they have here That's because they're just focused on sequels 
They're focused on recreating the magic of Jaws using effects, and they're trying. They're looking at the box office of other big shark movies. And what we're here to say is that they have something. They are sitting on something already. All they have to do is just look at what's there. And that's what we hope that the Book of Quint is going to do. It's going to open their eyes up. Uh, John, any final words before we turn episode 39 over to the Jaws obsession? Actually, yeah. You know, to everybody that's out there listening, you know, Ryan and I talk about a lot about how Jaws is a people film. It's about people. Now, what I want you to think about, how many friends have you made because of Jaws? How many conversations have you had with somebody on the subway, um, carpooling, at work, around the water cooler, or just you see a stranger in public that has on a Jaws shirt and you strike up a conversation? Yes. How many friends have you made because of Jaws? Because if it wasn't for Jaws, Ryan, I certainly wouldn't be here. Right. And that just goes to show that it's a people film. It also goes to show that with the box office now, it's number eight. The shark is still working, which means the people film is still working. Mm -hmm. And as a community, what everybody has to do, and this is something that bothers me when I see on the Jaws Facebook group pages where everybody's always arguing, well, you know, I'm right and you're wrong with it. There's this and there's that. Instead of doing that, Universal sees all of this. And, you know, I, I, I believe that could be why they've not done anything. What I'm trying to trying to get at is, as a community, everybody needs to come together and tell Universal, look, we don't want another cash grab. We, we don't want some gimmicky sequel or, you know, anything gimmicky, period. Right. We want a worthy entry into the Jaws franchise, and we want our franchise back, and everybody has to come together to do that. A stick by itself is weak and will break, but many sticks together is strong and will not break. Mm -hmm. Everybody has to come together. A lot of wisdom right there, John. That's un that, that you hit the nail on the head. The people movie, because we've all, I've made many friends, many conversations, breaking the ice many times throughout my entire life using the movie Jaws. And you're, you're correct. Think of the potential you have if you were to make a quality movie that captures the spirit that follows those characters that we love, that follows especially that one character, Mr. Quint. Think of the camaraderie that you'll have in the theater, just going to see it, or, or just the book, the, just the, the, the audio book we did, the comments that we've received, that I've received here, are unbelievable because people are just, they're, they're so thirsty for new Jaws material to see those characters, to learn about a little bit of history about Larry Vaughn or, or Quint or even Amity Island, a postcard. Mm -hmm. Universal, Universal could, it, we're, we sent a postcard out and, and people are just, wow. So that shows you how thirsty everybody is. I really do believe that with the people that are reviewing the manuscript for the book of Quint, the big name that will be with that we will be working with in the near future. I really do believe that Jaws, the its best days are ahead in the future. Its best days are coming up. I do believe that the Jaws Renaissance, they think that the best days were back then when Jaws opened up and everybody was, oh, wow, it's, you know, it, it, was a, it was a big summer blockbuster and all that stuff. Then it went to this dark period where we had substandard sequels and lampooning and running out of ideas. I think the best days are ahead and it starts now. And it really does start now because I am excited with the Book of Quint being officially done and we have a story here. We have a book, 436 pages, everybody, 436 pages. There's a lot there to comprehend. I think the best days are ahead. We're going to be that much closer together as a community if we, uh, if we come together on this. John, thank you so much for coming on board. Once again, teaching us about the intricacies of Jaws and providing us some <laughs> Great clues into the mentality of uh, Universal Studios. Thank you, John. No, you're welcome. All right, we'll talk to you later. Show me the way to go. I'm tired. I want to go to bed. I had a little drink about an hour ago. It's got right to my head. There's still time to jump on board with the Indiegogo campaign. 
Uh, we're going to have to call it a day on this campaign eventually because we're going to have the final number to go down to the printers. So bookofquint.com, jawsob.com. You follow the links to the Indiegogo campaign for the Book of Quint. You can join as a sponsor and get in line for a special limited edition printing of the Book of Quint. Very exciting to see. I We have uh, postcards that are still available for any late backers that might want to jump on. Everybody loves the postcards, and so do we. I have one hanging around my wall in front of me. It's very inspirational to see stuff materializing. The movie Jaws is copyrighted property of Universal Studios. Any references and sampling from the movie Jaws in this episode is intended to fall within Section 107 of the Copyright Act. Copyrighted materials are fairly used for the purposes of criticism, comment, reporting, and teaching, and research. Materials used here are protected by the fair use guidelines of Section 107 of the Copyright Act, all rights reserved to the copyright owners. So this has been Episode 39 of the Jaws Obsession. We are going to be coming up on Episode 40. I am going to try to get to the episode, one of the episodes I really wanted to get to, um, it's a, more of a technical episode with a lot of sampling, and it's going to be uh, uh, there's going to be a lot of preparing for that. So that will come up next week. It will be episode 40, 40 of the Jaws Obsession. In the meantime, you can write me here at jawsob2025 at gmail.com. Remember, jawsob.com, bookofquint.com. If you could please like, comment, share, subscribe these broadcasts will help us push this out to new listeners. We're getting new listeners every day. So about two more weeks left for getting on the Indiegogo campaign for the Book of Quint. Hope to see everyone over there. Thank you very much for listening this week. Until next week, farewell and adieu. Show me the way to go home.